G'day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here. 29th of December, 2016. And uh, I've just realized that the science show is going to carry David Suzuki's Christmas message. Therefore, I am prepared to record four 15 minute segments of his uh, address at Wome Adelaide in March 2016. Here with <clears throat> part one. Vice President elect Biden and I have announced some of the leaders who will advise us as we seek to meet America's 21st century challenges from strengthening our security, to rebuilding our economy, to preserving our planet for our children and our grandchildren. Whether it's the science to slow global warming, the technology to protect our troops and confront bioterror and weapons of mass destruction, the research to find life-saving cures, or the innovations to remake our industries and create 21st century jobs. Today, more than ever before, science holds the key to our survival as a planet and our security and prosperity as a nation. It's time we once again put science at the top of our agenda and work to restore America's place as the world leader in science and technology. Right now, in labs, classrooms, and companies across America, our leading minds are hard at work chasing the next big idea on the cusp of breakthroughs that could revolutionize our lives. But history tells us that they can't do it alone. From landing on the moon, to sequencing the human genome, to inventing the internet. America has been the first to cross that new frontier because we had leaders who paved the way. Leaders like President Kennedy, who inspired us to push the boundaries of the known world and achieve the impossible. Leaders who not only invested in our scientists, but who respected the integrity of the scientific process. Because the truth is that promoting science isn't just about providing resources. It's about protecting free and open inquiry it's about ensuring that facts and evidence are never twisted or obscured by politics or ideology. It's about listening to what our scientists have to say, even when it's inconvenient, especially when it's inconvenient. Because the highest purpose of science is the search for knowledge, truth, and a greater understanding of the world around us. I'm confident that if we recommit ourselves to discovery, if we support science education to create the next generation of scientists and engineers right here in America. If we have the vision to believe and invest in the things unseen, then we can lead the world into a new future of peace and prosperity. President Obama, eight years ago, how things change. And so to someone who seems hardly ever to change, David Suzuki, this is how he was introduced in Adelaide in March at the wonderful Botanic Gardens. Maruichanga, Ghana, me and I want Mani na bundi gani atano. Nai biriko mankal ankala tandanya mianaku. Nai cha yung andalya nai cha yakun andalya. Pardon me, Andrew Wadu. On behalf of the Ghana people, I welcome you all to Ghana country, and I do as ambassador of that late plains people. My brothers, my sisters, let's walk together in harmony. When I was a young lad, my uncle said to me, "Whenever you need a helping hand, son, you'll find one at the end of your arm." Sorry. Come on up, old man. Hey. I haven't said who he is yet. <laughs> First of all, thanks to the University of South Australia for putting on this brilliant Planet Talks. Three questions. Well, the first question is, have you heard of Venki Ramakrishna? Well, think about him. He is the new president of the Royal Society of London, one of the most powerful and important scientific leaders in the world. And he went to Unley Primary School. Problem. Two of the happiest years of his life, he says. First Indian to be in such an amazing position. The second question, which I hope David Suzuki will answer 
is uh, what did Maggie Trudeau do with Mick Jagger 40 years ago? <laughs> Smiling, you see. He wants a DNA analysis, yeah. That speaks a geneticist. And what David Suzuki did 40 years ago last October was start Quirks and Quarks, which is the sister program to the science show. My name is Robin Williams. I've done it since way back then, but he went walkabout doing other things, like founding the David Suzuki Foundation, where I talked to him last year, and the foundation is full of incredibly bright, charismatic people, young people doing wonderful work around the world, which is perhaps what David's going to talk about as well. Meet David Suzuki. Thank you, Robin. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Uh, so great to see you and still up and running and uh, kicking ass. Good for you. Good for you. It's always such a joy to return to Australia, but especially to Adelaide. I first want to say it's a privilege to stand on the traditional land of the Ghana people who lived and cared for it over thousands of years. And I'm so overjoyed that Uncle Lewis O'Brien is here to welcome us this day. <laughs> Uncle Lewis conferred on me one of the greatest honors I've received, which was a name, a Ghana name, and uh, I have carried it with a tremendous sense of honor but also responsibility to live up to that name. So thank you, Lewis O'Brien. I was also delighted to visit yesterday the Suzuki Forest. Do you know about that, Robin? It's, I don't know, somewhere up in the hills. I don't know where the heck we went. But uh, it was degraded land that uh, Mike ran when he was premier set aside to be uh, restored and designated as a forest in the future. I was thrilled to see that it's flourishing and to learn that it's right next to Schwarzenegger Forest. <laughs> so I'm sure the Terminator is going to be looking out after my little trees, too. These days, I always begin my talks by saying that I'm not here to speak on behalf of any group or organization. I don't speak for any political party or corporation. I'm here speaking as a grandfather and as an elder. And I believe this is the most important part of my life. You see, I don't have to play games anymore to get a job, a promotion, or a raise. I can speak the truth from my heart. If that offends people, that's their problem, not mine. <laughs> Elders have that credibility, I believe, because we're no longer driven by the need for more money or power or, or celebrity or sex. Well, there are a few elders. They need help. They've got problems. But most elders are like me. We th those are long past in our lives, so we can speak with a great deal of credibility. And elders have something no other group in society has. We've lived an entire life. We've learned a lot. We've made mistakes. We've suffered failures. We've had a few successes. Those are hard-won life lessons. And I believe it's our job. It's our responsibility now to troll through that life of experience for those nuggets that are of lessons that are worth passing on to the generations to come. So I urge my fellow elders everywhere, get the hell off the golf course or the couch and get on with the most important part of your life. Now, before, before I begin, I must admit that I, ever since I arrived in Australia last Sunday, I've been peppered by the press with questions about nuclear waste. I've only been in Australia for five days, for heaven's sakes. I'm supposed to tell you what to do with nuclear waste. My family has only been in Canada for 120 years, and Canada as a country has only existed for 150 years. I've lived all my life, and my culture has never had to worry about something like sustainability. The only group with any credibility on sustainability over thousands of years are the indigenous people everywhere. So to South Australians, to South Australians, to all Australians, I say, if you want to deal seriously with the issue of nuclear waste, let the Ghana and the other indigenous groups make the decision. They're the only ones that provide the viewpoint and the perspective to do it. You see, we stand at a unique moment in all of the history of life on this planet. That's four billion years of life. 99.9999% 99 
of all species that have ever existed in the four billion years are extinct. Extinction is the norm. But for the first time in those four billion years, one species that created the conditions for its own demise, that's us, recognizes the possibility of extinction and has the tools to avoid a catastrophic end. You know what we face, human activity, burning fossil fuels and machines, agricultural practices, especially raising cattle, warfare, are altering the chemistry of the atmosphere that in turn is trapping heat on the planet. I first realized that we have to take climate change seriously when I came to your country. In 1988, I was a guest in Melbourne of the Commission for the Future. And at that time, scientists showed me the evidence that they were gathering in climatology. And I went back to Canada saying, this is no longer a slow motion catastrophe. We got to get going on it right away. You're leading scientists. And the reality of life, drought, massive fires, reef degradation, show that you have a serious problem. And that there are also solutions here for clean energy in abundance. Australia should be leading the world. And I must say, I've been so proud of South Australia that Mike set, Mike Rand set in motion a, a path towards a future of clean energy. You're at 40% renewable energy now on the way to 50 and possibly 60. South Australians should be boasting to the world about what you are doing here. I certainly intend to when I go home. The failure, the failure of the federal governments of Canada and Australia to act in the face of the evidence and the enormous alternative opportunities to climate change is why many scientists and experts now declare the futility of simply eliminating the use of fossil fuels and call for mega projects like geoengineering and massive implementation of nuclear energy. It's crazy, but that's we're at a desperate position. Australia with vast deserts and sunlight Canadians would kill for, and you can't develop alternative solutions? Disgraceful. Japan, the most earthquake-prone country on the planet, brings nuclear plants to what? To boil water. This in a country that has boiling water in over 6,000 hot springs. We boast as a species that we're intelligent. In Canada, First Nations, environmentalists, climatologists have now been labeled the forces of no and eco-terrorists. Of course, climate is just one of the issues. There's a whole suite of ecological issues that are confronting us now. Oceans cover 70% of the planet's surface and they're a mess overfishing, islands of plastic, dead zones from agricultural runoff, sea level rise by warming and expansion of water and acidification from the dissolving of carbon dioxide in the ocean as carbonic acid. 80% of the forests on the land are gone. <clears throat> Hydrologic cycles are changing. We dread the disappearance of the monsoon reliability. Species are going extinct at a rate unparalleled since the last great extinction episode 65 million years ago. We toxic pollutants now have been poured into air, water, and soil. I'm sorry, however well you live, every one of us here carries dozens of toxic chemicals because of what we've done to the rest of the planet. We are a species out of control. We are expanding our ecological footprint. The amount of air, water, and land we require to live as we do is simply expanding. Climate change is just the most obviously pressing issue we confront now. But I have to say it's taken a hell of a long time before it's come to the level that it's at now. The first international conference on climate was held in Toronto in 1988. And at that time, the scientists were convinced the evidence was in and were so alarmed by what they were seeing that they issued a call for a 20% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in 15 years. That was the call, but we didn't take it seriously. 
And the record of political and corporate denial and monkey wrenching is why many scientists and experts despair. Okay, I'm sorry to call a halt to it, but we're approaching the upload limit back soon with an immediate new movie.